Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to this session, and, and thank you very much to the Scala.io organizers for uh, having me to speak. Uh, the link to the slides and, and code for my presentation is, is up here. I'll leave that up for a second if anybody wants to uh, uh, get to those. So this talk is called Functional Programming, the Enterprise Edition. So my name is Narek. Uh, I am a senior software engineer uh, and Scala developer at Salesforce um, in San Francisco, California. Uh, I'm a all-around functional programming advocate, and you can find me on Twitter uh, saying things at that handle right in the middle. Uh, so pictured here is the Salesforce Tower. Uh, it's the tallest building on the west side of the United States. Uh, of course, I'm working for Salesforce. Uh, we run a data platform. Uh, the team that I work on, uh, we're working mostly in Spark, uh, and we're doing streaming pipelines and microservices uh, in support of email applications. Um, we process millions of customer events per day, and we have a, a very active machine learning pipeline as well that augments uh, the data that goes into our email products. Um, so if you're interested in working with us in the Bay Area, uh, do reach out to me, and uh, Salesforce is also uh, hiring globally, so uh, talk to me about that as well. Uh, just a quick aside, I was at the top of that same tower not too long ago, last week. Incredible views, that's all I gotta say. Really nice. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's do a quick roll call. Um, who is writing Scala at work in the room? Almost everyone, Scala conference, go figure, right? Uh, out of those same people, are you writing purely functional Scala? That's what I thought. That's what we're here to fix. So let's talk about the title of the talk, Enterprise Functional Programming. Is this an oxymoron? Is this a buzzword that I use to get you to show up to the room? Uh, let's explore this a little bit. Uh, I think first what we need to do is, is define what is enterprise programming. So if we follow the definition of Martin Fowler, he talks about enterprise programming as the display, manipulation, storage of large amounts of data in support of the automation of business processes. It's a very vague and broad definition, which I think we can extend to just essentially any uh, large scale um, application backing a business. Um, so in enterprise programming, we're, we're optimizing for correctness. Uh, if we're running an accounting software, if we have a gain of a million dollars, we don't want to say we lost a million dollars. Uh, we want to be reliable in our software, right? Uh, so we don't have our customers leaving us for the competition. And we need to be flexible for changing business needs. Uh, so which means there's going to be constant updates. We're going to have features that come in that change the functionality of the, uh, of the enterprise application. So on the other side, uh, we want to define what functional programming is. I think every textbook and every talk has, has gone over this before, but I'll do it in three brief quotes. Programming with functions. Uh, no side effects. We don't like side effects in pure functional programming, and we don't like mutability in shared state. Right, so there's nothing new here. You've probably seen these before. In the functional programming realm, we want to be optimizing for three things. Uh, and the order of these may be debatable, but composability, so we want to be able to take small functions and build up larger applications based on those functions. Um, we're concerned with purity, uh, and depending on what side of the camps you fall on, purity may be number one, it may be number three, it depends. Uh, and then we, once we start getting into this, type, this uh, type class type of programming, we care about generic abstractions that we can reuse. So we've talked a little bit about the definitions of what these things are, but what are the generalizations that we associate with uh, each side? So I'm comparing a little bit. In the functional world, we think about pure functions. In enterprise code, really things are impure, uh, especially if you're in a language like Java that has a void where you can essentially uh, do a bunch of things, blow up a, a missile, and then add two numbers and return them. Uh, there really is no sense of purity when you have like a void type floating around. 
Uh, in functional code, we think of elegant, uh, clean uh, designs, uh, whereas in enterprise code, the reality is that we end up with a lot of complicated logic as we try to pile on additional features and we want to extend the software to do more things. Um, in FP, we also think about perfect abstractions. And in enterprise code, we have the opposite, OOP hell. Uh, so that's how you end up with these uh, cache builder, factory, client controller things. Right? Um, and then uh, when we're talking about the types of people that work on these codes, uh, you have the geniuses in the ivory tower working on functional programming, and then you have normal people like myself uh, on, on teams of 10 to 100, depending on the size of the corporation, uh, building enterprise software. Let's briefly also talk about the languages that pop up in both of these paradigms. So on the enterprise side, you have Java, really the queen of, of enterprise languages, uh, the, the behemoth of, of the current uh, state of affairs. You also have JavaScript that comes up in this list, and PHP, Python, the .NET languages, C++. And interesting, you, you have Java, uh, sorry, Scala as well. Um, I don't know if that's because of the Lightbend stack, if that's because of Spark, if that's because of just the fact that we can use all the Java libraries. Not really sure, but it's in that list. Uh, in the functional side, you see the usual sus suspects as well, uh, Haskell and OCaml, the ML family, uh, the Lisp family, Clojure, Erlang, uh, and then of course F-sharp, and again, Scala. So we see Scala in both lists, and maybe some of these other languages deserve to be in both as well, but because we're at a scholar conference, we're going to use this as our bridge. So my thesis is this. Uh, we're not going to be perfect, but I think pure functional uh, enterprise code is absolutely possible. Uh, and I think that functional abstractions are very well suited for commercial software, uh, despite what some may say. And we're going to use Scala as the medium, uh, uh, use it as a bridge to, to get us between uh, the enterprise world and this pure functional uh, dreamland. So some caveats. Uh, functional programming is still a niche. Uh, we are definitely dwarfed by the uh, hordes of imperative programmers. Uh, we are a very, very noble and small tribe working on this type of code. Um, teams using Scala are also not necessarily invested in functional programming. Uh, you have this kind of pervasive meme of, of Java and Scala that, that's in our industry as well. And another caveat is you have naysayers to functional programming that, that believe it's hocus pocus stuff that you don't want to uh, put into production. So we're going to keep all of these things in mind as we progress through the talk. So bringing up functional programming at work should not have to feel like this. You don't want to be Kanye West going on a rant. You want to be a you know, legitimate colleague proposing ideas that you can deploy into production and, and build quality software with. But unfortunately, this is how we end up looking a lot of the time. When we start talking about some of these things, say in, in CATS or Scala Z or, or uh, the last thing you read online about uh, category theory. Um, but that's because the, the imperative mindset is the default in the software world. Why? Why is this the case? I have three places to blame. First, you can blame COBOL. If you look at this uh, cute illustration of uh, the early history of programming languages, you see in the 60s we have Fortran uh, coming out in academia. You have Lisp as well coming out of, I think, Bell Labs. Uh, and you have this slow progression up until this Cro-Magnon age with, with COBOL taking over uh, business systems programming, right? It almost defined business systems programming for that, uh, for that era. Um, and if you fast forward this exact timeline into the 90s, uh, you start to see Java taking the exact same role. So the, 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 the where, where's that little, the little lispers keep refining their lisp techniques, but they're also getting eaten by the, the large object-oriented procedural uh, business machine. So the other thing you can blame is you can blame universities um, because the curriculum in universities tends to focus on C, Java, Python. Uh, maybe if you're lucky you encounter like a ML or a scheme at some point, but it's, it's not going to be the main meat of the, of the, uh, of the coursework. Uh, so functional concepts really only play a minor role in CS education, maybe in theoretical computer science. Maybe if you take a PLT class, you, you encounter some of these, like lambda calculus as a, as a uh, computational style rather than a, a RAM machine, uh, or a Turing machine for that matter. Uh, and also you have uh, f these camps that say that functional languages are too high level for teaching the fundamentals of computer engineering. So we've got 
universities to blame. We also have fear to blame, and I think this is the biggest one. So programmers are afraid, because if, if they're new to functional programming, or they don't really know much about it, they see scary math stuff, I don't want to do it, what, what is this math doing in my day-to-day uh, -day code? You also have folks that are learning uh, functional programming that have imposter syndrome. I'm not perfect enough. I can't uh, put this stuff uh, into, into use yet. And of course, managers are also afraid because, well, if you deploy this thing, who's going to maintain it when you leave? Nobody else understands what this is. And of course, we've mentioned the naysayers as well, the people that will fight you uh, against putting functional programming uh, into your day-to-day -day work. But we want to show that functional programming is useful without scaring people. And this is uh, kind of the gist of what I want to get into. So the rest of this talk is structured as such. I have two parts. Uh, there's applied functional abstractions uh, that I want to use in enterprise programming. And the second part is strategies for introducing and fostering functional thinking in, in commercial software development. Some more caveats. Uh, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with Scala syntax. I'm not going to bother with that part. But I'm going to say that this is not a first principles talk. Uh, I'm not really intending to go over a lot of theory. I really want to show these things in application and in use. If you're interested in the theory, uh, there are plenty of books that I can recommend, including the Red Book and the, the Cats Book and uh, quite a few others. Uh, and I'm going to be using the uh, CATS type class library in some of the examples, um, but Scala Z examples would be exactly the same, if not similar. So, applied functional programming abstractions. Who's seen this cartoon? This, this cartoon is more clever than uh, you may think. I think it's a bit of a double entendre because uh, it's saying that, that Haskell code doesn't have side effects. Fine. And nobody will ever run it saying, OK, nobody's going to put Haskell into production. But there's another side to it. Haskell is lazy. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, something that's maybe a little bit overlooked uh, when people see this punchline. Uh, but we're really interested in this because of the conversation that it starts about side effects. So what are side effects and what are effects? I want to make a, a distinction, even though they're very, very, very similar. So an effect is a consequence or a context or some change to the world that happens as a result of a computation that we want to run. Uh, the difference, though, between effects and side effects is one is accounted for in the type system and one is unaccounted for. Right? So we have this void problem uh, versus, er uh, versus effects, where you have a, a type that represents that particular effect. So some of the most common computational effects that we run into in the enterprise world are partiality, uh, failures, and I.O. Um, and I'm going to go through a couple examples in each of these. Some of them you may have seen, some of, may, some of them you may have not seen. Um, and, and we can hope to, to find some interesting applications of functional patterns when dealing with these uh, effects. So we want to establish that effects are central to enterprise programming, because without effects, we don't have useful programs. If we don't have I.O., if we don't have missing data, we really aren't really working with the real world. Uh, and we also want to establish that composition is the essence of functional programming. So we want to be able to compose effects. But how do we compose effects? I promise this is the only diagram that I'm going to show that looks like this. And I'll explain it in depth uh, in case there's any confusion. Uh, so what we're looking at here is essentially a diagram of three different types, A, B, and C. Uh, but getting from A to B requires us to uh, have some kind of context and some uh, awareness of it by using this thing, F. Uh, and we have another uh, arrow that goes from B to C, but it's also shrouded in this F context mystery. We want to be able to compose these two to get from A to C. Right? This is known as the Kleisley category. Um, and and the, the trick to getting there, this dotted yellow line, is, is brought to you by flat map, none other than flat map, which we see in, in Scala everywhere. So we want to take this and apply this to the missing data problem. So partiality is a, is a concept from math that applies very well in enterprise programming. So you have a, a, a domain uh, where not everything maps to the codomain. You don't have an answer for every uh, input you get to a function. Right? So empty database queries, or a function just having no result to compute, um, or an object in Java missing a field. Um, so you have this, this concept that's been prevalent in programming, and, and imperative languages have historically used null to deal with this. Um, but you know what comes with null. Null pointer exception. So luckily, Scala has this uh, great little tool uh, in the standard library called option. You've seen this. Um, option is an algebraic data type in the sense that it's a sum 
uh, of, of none and some, some with an M-E, not S-U-M. Uh, and then it's also a type constructor because it is uh, effectively taking this type A, which is a generic type, and bringing it into this context of, of optionality, uh, if we want to call it as such. So it's a very simple and powerful tool, and it solves a lot of problems. So we have this powerful effect abstraction for partiality, but what are the imperative people doing with it when they encounter it? They're using it just like Java null, and we want to fix that. Uh, so we have this very, very basic example of two caches in memory. Uh, we have a, a mapping from a person to a location, um, and, and we have a second mapping from location uh, to transit stops uh, in, in the borough, uh, boroughs of New York. So we know that Scala's map uh, implements uh, get, which returns an option for our value uh, given some key. So simply, we just want to do this. We want to list the stops that are available for that person uh, as a concatenated string, like a comma-separated string. Um, so we want to select a person from the first cache, and then uh, if they're there, uh, check their subway stops, and then transform it into a string. This is the Java approach. Uh, <laughs> and I'm maybe being a little bit unfair because I realize that we do have optional in some of these uh, things available in Java 8. But the imperative approach is this. You look up one thing. You check if it's there. If it's there, you, you get the value and then check in the other cache for the other thing. And then finally, you know, do some uh, mutation of a string and then finally return it if, you, if you're able to have some result. The functional approach solves this in four lines. Uh, so all we're, do, all we're doing is we're taking the, the get method that's available on the map, we're binding it to the get method on the other map, so we're just threading the value that comes out of the um, person location map directly into the next one, and then we're folding the result. We're saying we have a default value for when there's nothing, and then we have a function that we want to compute when we do have a value, which is uh, collapsing this list into a comma-separated string. So we see down here in the interpreter that it works. Um, there's another nice thing that I want to show is this for comprehension that you may have seen in, in Scala already. Um, so this is just a syntactic shooter to do the exact same thing. It just uh, becomes more and more cumbersome if you're s stacking and layering these flat maps. It's nice to have this syntax that, that helps us accomplish uh, pretty much the same. So I have another example. Uh, this is going to jump the difficulty a little bit, but it's exactly the same concept. So who's dealt with nested Java objects before? Um, yeah. So you know that we have these very, very complicated uh, Java objects that, that contain multiple fields. You have, in this case, a Java API client that takes an API client config. The API client config has its own fields, and it contains some type called token. Token has its own fields, right? We want to co combine these all together to have an API client and use it. Um, but I can formulate this two ways. I have a well-formed API client that has all the right fields in all the right places, but then I have a, a poorly formed one, maybe because uh, my colleague or myself forgot to fill something in. And you could you know, have legal Scala that allows you to pass a null into a field like this, and, and you don't know that it's there. It's not going to tell you. So when you're reaching into this nested object structure to try to find the content of the token and then get the length of the token for, for whatever reason, you end up with an NPE and it crashes your code. Not good. So I want to use the same concept from option to be able to create a uh, a very safe version of the Java getter pattern. So I said it's going to jump a little bit in difficulty, but it's really the same concept. Um, instead of talking about a option type in this case, we're using option as a context uh, in terms of a Kleisley arrow. So a Kleisley arrow is exactly that arrow we saw from A to FB in the f uh, a few slides ago. right? So all we're doing is we're saying, I have this safe getter, which takes a function from A to B and I'm able to lift it into a Kleisley arrow that goes from A to option of B, right? And so I can create some, uh, a little, little bit of implicit magic to implement this uh, question mark down here. So you should think of that as like get versus just get, right? So it's like get it if it's there. So all I'm doing is taking some safe getter, lifting a new one, and then composing them together using and then, which is the, the Kleisley uh, version of composition. So we want to use this to do the exact same thing we were doing in the previous slide. And we have this like nice, pretty, flowing syntax. So we, we create a, a safe getter from the API client to the client config. We need this for type inference reasons. But then afterward, we can chain all of these getters back to back and have this safe uh, 
uh, view into the, to the bottom of the object and, and compute exactly what we want. And so we see when we run it on the bad one, we get none back. And if we run it on the good one, we get some of the, the length of the thing that was in there back. So why does the imperative style of, of coding make things so complicated? Um, this is because the imperative style lacks effect abstraction. Uh, we're reinventing the same computational patterns over and over and over again, whereas the functional approach in Scala creates a declarative pipeline. The difference here is that Scala uses combinators as they were intended, or functional Scala uses combinators to combine effects. So we're using the tools that are already available to us in the language and a little bit of help from these type class libraries to be able to combine, combine effects and have clean code that doesn't repeat the same patterns over and over again. Like we saw just a couple slides ago, in 10 lines I solved like a, a problem that's been bothering Java people for, for decades probably. Um, oh, oh, looks like we got an error. I math just threw a BSOD. Let's talk about failure, uh, which is the next uh, computational pattern. So exceptions exist naturally in programming. Um, enterprise programmers know them really well because they are a showstopper. If you have an uncaught one that goes into prod, your application stops, and you're figuring out what happened and what through. Um, so traditionally, we deal with exceptions using the try, catch, finally boilerplate, right? And this, this is really all it is. It's boilerplate. Um, and it also becomes hard to attribute uh, what exactly went wrong because a lot of people just tend to catch exception E and then figure out what happens from there, right? Sometimes you get a null. Sometimes you get a log message. You don't really know. So it's hard to attribute what happened. Um, so, of course, Scala, again, in the standard library, has some types that help us with this. We have the either, which is a, a sum type, again, of a left and right. It's a type constructor on the type A. And then we have try, which is a little bit of a uh, specialization over either, where it has a failure side and a success side. Uh, we'll deal with either today, uh, but like you could really just do this exact same example in try. So we want to model a website signup flow. We want to create this function signup flow that takes an account request and returns an account response. We have this case class account response uh, request that has some uh, user fields. And then we have a response which is either denied or granted, uh, depending on what happens when we try to uh, validate this user's signup. So we have two library functions available, um, and they are both dangerous, and we have no control over fixing them, and we want to be able to deal with them in a, in a sane way. So we have this encrypt function that wants to encrypt the customer's password, uh, but it can throw, depending on the input. So it has an illegal ar argument exception that's unchecked. We also have this validate email uh, function that has a hidden error, and that's right all the way at the bottom. Somebody's calling head when they should not be, because that's unsafe. Right, so either of these can throw uh, an, an exception depending on the input. So the imperative style of, of Java is actually kind of clean here. Uh, if, if you want to compare to the previous thing, you can run the encrypted uh, function, you can run the validation function, and then you know, catch any error that comes up and, and return this denied message. Otherwise, you know, we get this granted message that we want to return. But the problem is it doesn't compose. Um, if we wanted to chain multiple of these actions together, uh, we wouldn't be able to. Um, so it doesn't compose, and we want to show that Scala can do this. There we go. So uh, we're going to create like a, a quick type alias called result, which effectively just says, is this an either? We know the left side is, is throwable. Let's forget about that and think a little bit more about our return type that we care about. We create a couple helper functions that effectively just create a shim over the uh, API that we're trying to protect. So we just have this either catch non-fatal. It's an implicit method that comes with the cats library. It's not in the standard library. Um, but we're essentially just, it's effectively a try catch block that, that takes any uh, exception that comes out of these functions and lifts them into the uh, value domain so we can act on them as values. So once we've done that, uh, we can do a very, very quick thing, which is summon the applicative instance of result and call map2 to be able to take both of these things, join them together, and then calculate uh, our granted request. Um, if this is unclear what this is doing, this is effectively looking for an implicit uh, value of applicative for this result type. So the compiler is saying, OK, I want a result. What's result? It's an either throwable A. OK, great. I can do this, because cats defines this. 
right? So I have this applicative thing that allows me to take two things that are, that are in separate context, right? They don't depend on each other at all, and I'm able to join them together despite being in separate contexts and apply them to a function to get the value that I want. Finally, I can call this safe, uh, safe setup from our safe signup flow, fold the result, and get what I want. So in the uh, lower two cases, we have the, the bad request, gives me back our denied, and in the, uh, the good request, we get our granted um, response. So applicative opens up parallelism in our code flow. It allows us to abstract over data in separate contexts. Uh, I believe Katz even defines this up to like map 22 or product 22. So you can just have all of these different things from different places uh, coming together into a single context. And it's really, really nice for validation. So the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the, uh, to the other side of the talk is I.O. Um, we need to communicate with external resources. It's very critical. You have a useless application if you're not on the internet, right? You, if you can't talk to a file system, if you can't use buckets in S3, if you can't use databases, you need to be able to communicate with the external world. The imperative world doesn't have a principled way to handle I.O. Sometimes you have uh, try-catch blocks. Sometimes you have this async await pattern with event loops. And then even you have the uh, Scala future, which is interesting, but it's also forcing you to be asynchronous, and you end up in callback hell, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Sometimes I just want to be synchronous. It's, it's OK. Um, so there's a whole talk about this today, uh, I think tomorrow, about Cat's Effect I.O., but I want to go over this quickly as well, uh, just because it's interesting. And, and I've been using it myself a lot in my day-to-day -day work. So Cat's Effect I.O. Uh, is effectively an I.O. data type. Um, it creates a referentially transparent uh, way to take um, impure things, like say a database call or a write to a file system, and suspend them, and then make them composable as values. So it allows you to separate the actions that you want to do. So you can create these I/O programs in the value space, and then it's, it separates the way that you execute. So that you have this rich control API that lets you run them synchronously or asynchronously or catch all of the errors using this attempt method that's on there or cancel and release resources on any error. It's a, a very, very nice API to work with. So a very basic example that I want to show in I.O. is, is say you want to have a, a, a bunch of buckets in S3 where we're containing some types. So we have a location, um, uh, we have a restaurant that has a location and a name, and then you have reviews. So we want to have a couple buckets where we can search by keyword um, some string and get back a, a restaurant, right? And uh, it, we also have this review data lake where, based on a restaurant, we have a list of reviews for that restaurant. We're imagining that we are a back end to a um, food review website. So we want to implement this search and review bot that's able to take a, a keyword, pull up the uh, restaurant, and then depending on some predicate from restaurant to Boolean, uh, write a review that we pre-supply. So we want this bot to be able to just go in and spam the back end and add reviews to populate um, for, for our website's launch. Uh, the problem is we're forced to use this S3 API, which I'm faking uh, in Scala, but we have a fetch method that sleeps for one second, and then it gets a key. The key is, of course, an option again, because we're, we're just using this mutable map as our example. Um, and then you have a write, which does a mutation and does a little sleep and then it returns a one to simulate like one record has been written. So in order to be able to uh, use this in, in I.O. land, we want to be able to lift both of these uh, functions up into I.O. So uh, in the write case, we have a very, very basic thing. We just use the I.O. constructor, and then we call write from within it. So what happens here is it suspends the write. It doesn't actually occur. And it allows us to now have an I.O. value representing this write happening that returns I.O. of int, as we see here. In the fetch case, it's a little bit different because the fetch, as we know, is returning an option. So we use this thing called option T to, to simplify a little bit uh, when we deal with this. So option T is, is a monad transformer, but it's not something to be afraid of. It's really just a helpful tool that says, OK, if I have an I.O. of some F, in this case an option, I have an easier way to deal with it, and the transformer effectively implements that for me. So we've lifted both of our fetch and write uh, functions into I.O. We want to compose them together. So we implement this search restaurants thing that takes a, a search uh, keyword and then really just delegates out to I.O. fetch. Right? So we have our search data lake, and we have our search term. It returns an option of I.O. of restaurant. Right? And then we have an insert review, which is a little bit more complicated, where we're fetching from the reviews data lake a um, specific uh, restaurant, 
and then we're capturing the reviews uh, we're figuring out what to insert. So if there are no reviews, we just create our review and put it in a list. Otherwise, we append our, uh, uh, we prepend our review to the list of existing reviews, and then finally use this write method um, to to insert them and then yield the the number of records inserted. Right. So it's very very clear how the data flows in this example. So what we want to do is just be able to compose these two uh, to create our little bot program. So we have search and review here, which again takes a search string. We have a predicate from restaurant to Boolean. The bot wants to determine what to do. And then we have our uh, default review that we want to insert. So all we do is we search restaurants. We call a value on the uh, option T to be able to extract the original version and not the op uh, option T version. And then we have our option here that we're filtering on a predicate and then folding uh, using the uh, zero as our kind of base case uh, in the event that there's nothing there. We wrote zero records. That's really what that's trying to say. Otherwise, we're inserting um, the review. And essentially, so we have this, this, this nice and well-composed function that, that does exactly what our business logic is, but it's important to realize that, again, this is just a value. Nothing is being done. This is all lazy. Nothing has happened yet. It is now up to the user to take this and run it. So we have all these execution methods that are available in Cat's Effect uh, that allow us to do this. And then one more quick example before we get into the second half of the talk. Uh, it's just this, this tiny little thing that I love, and it's one of the, uh, the nicest things uh, for me that, that CATS brings to the table uh, and functional programming brings to the table. I want to write many, many reviews to the data lake. How many lines would this take to do in Java or, or in just like an imperative style of programming? Traverse. All you need is traverse. You have a list of reviews. You just traverse over them. You have your insert review that's going into uh, I.O. context. Traverse takes the I.O. and the list and flips them. So now you have an I.O. of a list of the results that come back from the right. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I just wanted to throw that in the last minute. So I.O. can be used, as we can see, as, as like a systems glue. It creates a safe, uh, composable layer over uh, in otherwise impure things. So the laziness allows us to uh, separate the program definition from its execution. And of course, it brings us improved testability because now we don't need mocks. We just have values that tell us exactly what's happening uh, in these reads and writes. Another cool, a couple cool uses of I.O. are creating safe bindings over impure libraries like we saw. I've done this recently with Kafka. Um, we also have this ability to make these, com these composable executor programs that you can throw at a Spark executor and have the Spark executor run it. Um, so, you, so you can reuse all of the pieces and, and build different things that you can tell Spark executor to do. And then I.O., as, as you'll see, is also available as a pluggable effect type in uh, some database libraries. It's in uh, Doobie as, as one of the main effect types. It's also in FS2. Uh, so if you notice some patterns in the things that we've seen, we're really just using like three different type classes here. And I'm not going to go too, in depth in, too much in depth into this, but we're using functor, applicative, and monad. Right? And these are scary math terms that you don't want to throw around at work, per se, but it's really nice to see the underlying wiring that allows us, allows us to have this very uh, useful APIs that we can work with uh, in the enterprise setting. So all the types that we use uh, belong to the above and, and then some. There's a very, very long and uh, interesting web of type classes that, that come with uh, some of these libraries, um, so it's worth looking into. And of course, things get much more advanced from here, but we really want to use this stuff at work. Uh, we don't want to get too caught up in the theory, and we want to be able to talk to people about this and get it running because it works. So as a functional programmer, uh, you have to keep in mind that you have to be a teacher and a salesperson all at the same time. So let that one sink in. So if, if you're the person bringing this type of uh, new material to the table at your, at your place of work, uh, to your team, um, you both need to be able to convince them that this is a good idea to do while making sure that they're not afraid and running for the door when you start showing them some of this more advanced functionality. So that brings me to the second part of the talk, which is, you know, what are the methods for functional programming advocacy that you can walk away with and take to your teams back at work? So we have eight of them, and I'm going to run through these. First one is, use principal libraries. We have a lot of really, really good libraries in the Scala ecosystem, including CATS, of course, as we've seen here, Scala Z, the ZIO library. Uh, there's Doobie for data, database connections, FS2 for, for building uh, concurrency and pipelines. Um, and you also have uh, Shapeless for, for the folks that want to get into like the weirder side of things, generic programming. 
So lead by example with this. Like you, you're allowed to bring in these dependencies and use them. Uh, and once people see that the, the amount of code that you save by using these types of libraries, uh, I think they'll follow. It's very, very cool. Um, the next thing is, if you're an experienced functional programming person, be a mentor consultant. So if the things that you saw today are not new to you, um, and, and you already understand them, um, take away this. Offer your time for workshops. Like, if people at your work want to know more about what you've been doing in your code, show them. Show up at architecture reviews. Um, help people debugging if they want to get into it. And encourage people on your team that are learning functional programming to just get out of the, uh, the, the comfort zone and try it out. And finally, like, don't just hide in the corner writing all this beautiful you know, type class driven code. Show it off. Show people what you're doing and, and make sure that other people are looped in when you're using these types of patterns. It's not just for you to feel good. It's really for the betterment of the business. So why not show it off? If you're new to functional programming, so this is the other side of it, just do it. Um, find a small project at work. Find a small project at home. Find something that you can do and start practicing the patterns. The analogy that I like to use with this is if you only sit around and read and think about skiing, you're not going to be able to ski by doing it. Right? You have to go and fall and, and figure this type of thing out. Um, of course, I, I'm going to put a caveat here again. Don't do this in the middle of a huge deliverable. Uh, <laughs> You're going to end up like this. Uh, don't, don't do that. But, but I think there are a lot of um, very, very suitable scenarios that, that you can learn to pick out that, that you can take these concepts into and start experimenting with. So focus on business value is the next thing. And I want to stress the first point again. You're not going to sell functional programming at work by shouting category theory terms at your colleagues. It just doesn't work. Believe me. Um, but what you do want to focus on is the tangible improvements that you can get out of using functional programming patterns in an enterprise code base. Uh, so here are a few examples of this. So if you use pure functions, you're going to have a lot easier time testing things because you don't have all this kind of tangled mess of code. You have a lot of small bits of functionality that do exactly one thing and they do it well. Um, the fact that you have modularity in, in functional programming and the fact that that's encouraged makes code reuse a lot easier. This is a very, very easy sell to people, right? Static types um, usually mean correctness. This is not always the case. That's why there's a little tilde there instead of a, a straight equivalence. But the fact that you have types that represent the things that are happening, especially in pure functional code, uh, will get you a lot, lot farther than, say, void or unit when you're uh, trying to deploy programs that do important things that deal with the outside world. So these types really help us with correctness in the code. And of course, having errors in, in the value space rather than being thrown uh, gives us higher uptime, makes our customers happy, makes our bosses happy. It's a very, very good thing to have. So the next thing uh, is essentially organizing and speaking. That's another uh, method that I want to stress here. Um, set up an internal meetup at your office. Read the Red Book with your colleagues. Read uh, Bartosz Milievsky's Category Theory book. Do something. Uh, there's, there's a lot of very, very good ways to connect with people and start sharing knowledge and learning together uh, that you can do by doing this. Um, another thing is submit talks to conferences, practical ones. Like it, It's totally open for you to do. You should absolutely do it. Um, and of course, if you're not the public speaking type of person, write blog posts. People will read them. People do read blog posts. I've probably looked at multiple blog posts while preparing these slides. So, so absolutely do this. Number three is uh, refactor things. So whenever you have the opportunity to look at like a legacy code base or a big monolith, you have this ripe opportunity to refactor and break things up into subsystems. When you start separating things out into uh, their own repos or creating microservices, you have this green field where you can bring in this, this functional style of programming that's not going to be invasive to the rest of the code base. You're able to, to start taking these patterns and applying them in kind of a safe space, uh, or so to speak. And the same goes with uh, building libraries and modules. You're already in this like isolated zone where you can uh, experiment a little bit and, and bring in some good patterns. Um, so this is a perfect, perfect place to start introducing these things. Number two is pull requests. Uh, who reviews pull requests? Everybody here, right? Have to. Um, 
they are a very, very effective and bite-sized way to start communicating some of these patterns to colleagues. Um, so it's, it's a great way to see what people are doing well, and as well as being able to catch like impure procedural code, especially in Scala, and suggest the functional alternative. So it's, um, it's perfect for catching these things and trying to get some of these alternatives into play, but at the same time, you have this opportunity to teach and mentor other uh, developers with respect to functional techniques. So pull requests are a, a, the number two thing that you can take away from this and, and take to work. And ultimately, number one, check your ego at the door. Functional programming, as we all know, already has a bad rap for being inaccessible. We don't want to continue this because elitism does not get you very far. We want to focus on approachability and applications, and we want to save the theory for later when people are interested to know. We really, really want to focus on bringing the approachable side of functional programming into practice before the theory, because it tends to yield better results. So I'm going to leave you with this. If people understand why, they will want to know how. So if we understand why we do these things, so if we apply some of these patterns that we saw, these monads and functors and applicatives, uh, into the code and see how, what they really, really like yield us in terms of productivity and, and code cleanliness, they will want to then know how, and that's, that's when you can jump into the category theory stuff. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. I will be open for questions and happy to chat with anybody after the talk. Do we have time? I think it's very cool, actually. I actually think it's very cool. They, they actually implement a lot of the same behaviors. Like you have maps and contra maps and some of these very interesting things from the type class realm. Yeah, absolutely. How, how is your situation at Salesforce in terms of uh, an amount of, of Scala or maybe pure thinking people, whether it be uh, Scala or Kotlin or, or something that allows functional style for this? Java people pouring in? Are you spending a lot of time mentoring teams that are trying to make a decision or, or don't want to make a decision but you will try to teach anyway? Or how? Absolutely. Yeah. So so we are, um, so the division that I'm in is is the most Scala heavy at, at Salesforce. Um, so we sit alongside the, the folks that are the uh, Einstein division. There's a talk here about Transmogriff AI, which is an Einstein open source project. Uh, so between my group, which is the activities platform, and, and them, we probably have about like 50 to 100 people, and um, among us, like a growing majority are, are working with Scala. Um, and as far as pure functional programming goes, we have a handful of folks that are really helping and trying to drive this discussion. So it's definitely happening. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a quick question. How do you approach? Uh, the ch um, uh, changing our architecture from let us from microservices to SQLs, for example, as let's take Logum as um, technology, and you you need to to convince your boss to to that. Uh, Absolutely, I think data matters a lot there. Um, you have to look at like the what is the track record for the for the application that's in play. Right? You mentioned a specific framework, but really you have to look at what the track record is for that framework from a like safety and maintainability standpoint. How many times have you guys had issues trying to fix things? Right? Um, I think that's really the, the area that you should zone in on is can we bring in some of these type class patterns to be able to fix these issues? Hello, thank, thank you for, for the talk. It's very interesting. I have a question. I just want to know how to handle the uh, boundary between uh, pure and impure code in your uh, like production software, because uh, the examples you show here is very nice little, and it's uh, of course when you change from imperative style to functional program style, it's, uh, it looks cool and it's very concise. But when it comes to the 
uh, architecture, you have uh, your config, you have your logging, and uh, you want to handle them all purely, and maybe it will s scare more your uh, project uh, leader or something. And I want to know how do you handle this? Absolutely. So I've actually recently done that, including with Log4j. So it's, it's possible. So if you lift Log4j into I.O., you can actually have composable lazy logging. Um, so, so I think that the trick with this is really to isolate the areas that are supposed to be pure, and any boundary that you have that interacts with the outside, use a type that will allow you to make it uh, lazy or composable. So you really have to kind of set a wall around uh, the code that you want to be pure and functional. Um, so I realize it's a bit of like a hand wavy answer, but uh, it is entirely possible. Um, even in like the monolithic type of applications, you can develop classes or specific areas of the code base that are pure and side effect free. Maybe they get called by some impure code, but at least you've created a, uh, you know, you've taken one notch up on the belt in terms of um, cleanliness in the code base. Yeah, the f for the example of uh, a logging or for in impure way, you, maybe you can make it an IO, uh, IO um, a monad, then another way in, in pure functional, you can make it a reader uh, yeah. monad. And uh, in this uh, specific uh, case, uh, how do you handle the logging in your code? Do you use reader or IO? Uh, specifically IO, actually. So the, so the most of my application is oh, based right, on so. IO, yeah. So we're not using reader for that, though, that, I mean, that is a great pattern for dependency injection as well. Uh, but the I.O., uh, what we ended up doing is, because the code all goes to a Spark executor in a streaming job, we have our kind of interactive pieces of code all lifted into I.O., and we have them composed in one big, uh, essentially monadic for comprehension that runs in the executor. So we're able to take I.O. and simply just lift it, uh, sorry, log and simply just lift it into I.O. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This is the, the last uh, question. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, just a quick question, because uh, we don't all have nice project with uh, microservices and nice small stuff building together. Mm -hmm. So this is more a, a, a question on how to uh, go there. Uh, I mean, would you advise on uh, having some top-down approach, or uh, maybe going from the bottom of the application and then go up? Uh, because we can't do that in one day. We will have to build block by block. Yeah, I mean, I think the best phrase for this is you can't boil the ocean, right? Like, it's, it's a gargantuan task to try to take, like, you know, some legacy monolithic code base and try to say, oh, yeah, we're going to just make this into microservices. We have, you know, 10 sprints to do this. It's impossible. Um, so I think the bottom-up approach, as you're uh, alluding to, is probably the best way, is finding pieces of functionality that can be easily decoupled and made into their own services or simply made into their own libraries, really. Like, you don't have to necessarily deploy them as their own thing. You can just isolate the code and, and have kind of a domain boundary established with a library as well. Okay, thank you, everyone.